Yeah. Well, good evening. Thank you, Blake. That was quite an introduction. And, and, and thank you, Matt, so much for the opportunity to be here. It's truly an honor, particularly for me, because of the significance of this day. Eight years ago, this moment, I was just waking up in the ICU of a hospital in downtown Indianapolis. I had this plastic muzzle over my mouth that was completely covering my face. There was a tube that was going down my throat and into my lungs. And there was nothing covering my body. I wasn't in any casts. I didn't have any broken bones or um, bruises. I wasn't in any pain. There was nothing but a sheet over me. My body was there. But I couldn't move a muscle. I couldn't move a toe. I couldn't flex a finger. I couldn't lift an arm. The only thing that I could do was listen to the you know, beeps of that EKG machine and hear this gravelly, low, consistent, artificial breathing. It sounded like Darth Vader in the room with me. And I quickly realized that those were my breaths. There was a machine breathing for me because I couldn't do it on my own. And I was perfectly lucid. I was thinking the same way I'm thinking right now. And everything from the day before just rushed back to, to my conscious. I had broken my neck in a swimming accident the day before. I had sustained a spinal cord injury and I was completely paralyzed from the neck down. And doctors had given me the very likely scenario that I'd never move another muscle again for the rest of my life. So I'm trying to process this in my, in my mind and you, you name an emotion, you know, it, panic, fear. It was the first time I had woken up since my accident. So it was the first time everything had you know, kind of come back to my conscious saying, this is real. And I thought my life was over. I thought that I had all these plans in life. I hadn't accomplished them yet. I had never even gotten a chance to realize what they were and time had run out on me. My life had been snuffed out before it even began. I never could have possibly had calculated the journey that the next eight years would take me on. My physical rehabilitation won part of that. You see me standing here today and that was certainly a big part of it. It took years of grueling therapy and relearning every movement to get to me where I am today. But that was one leg of this odyssey I've been on because another part took me through a complex healthcare system. I became aware of, of voids in the healthcare system. I didn't know we're there and I became really instilled with this passion to try to fix some of those problems. And on a personal level, it took me on a journey of, of growth and purpose that I didn't even know was, was possible. So that's what I want to talk with you about tonight. And it starts right here. The, uh, the day, August 8th, 2010, the bridge that changed my life forever. So I'll take you back on this day, eight years ago, I was, very, I was 28 years old. I was a bachelor. I had a great job at the tech startup company in Indianapolis. I worked in communications. I had, I had kind of gravitated toward that uh, for my former career that started in television news as a reporter. And um, I was active, athletic. I was the guy that was always on the go, always doing something. When someone wanted help moving, that was the guy they'd call. I, was, I played sports. I was in the gym every week. I volunteered with the Red Cross after Katrina. I volunteered in Australia. I, I, my abilities were very much a definition of who I was. And on this day, it was a typical day. I was kayaking on this river in southern Indiana with two of my best friends. And we came up, up, across this bridge about halfway through the trip. That was sort of towering above the, the skyline there. There were a handful of people on that bridge jumping off into the water. Other kayakers, some other individuals that had been, you know, taking a break and swimming. So of course we took a break, it looked like fun, it wasn't long before we were right up there with them along that, that very first level that you can see there on the bridge. And we were jumping off into the water. The water was deep, it wasn't you know, particularly dangerous. We were jumping feet first, but then we got a better idea. That top truss all the way up there looked pretty inviting. <laughs> it was about 50 feet up and 
didn't take long before I was clambering up that vertical beam, kind of like a raccoon in, you know, in an oak tree or something like that. And it was kind of a tough, tough climb. Took a lot of strength, but I managed to swing my leg on top of that top beam and I was up there about 50 feet up. And it would be the last act of physical strength I would ever perform. I, I'm, I'm up there on top of that beam, looking out over, over the river and I instantly wanted off. I wasn't scared of heights, but I wanted off that beam. And I'm about to jump off, and I hear this voice from below telling me to wait. And it, it wasn't one of my friends, it was from a guy I didn't know. I kind of looked down, um, and I said, okay, that's great. I could, it's always fun when you have a partner to jump off with. So he wanted to climb up there with me, and so we started scaling that exact same beam. He made his way up, and we're sitting there right where the beams intersect. Like two birds on a wire, we're only about a foot off of each other. And I, we had a very brief conversation, I'll, I'll never forget it. He goes, he goes, man, you can see everything from up here. I cut him off, and I said, yeah, that's great, man. Look, I'm gonna jump in three seconds. Are you ready? <laughs> I really cut the guy off, because I wanted off. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm ready. So that's what we did, we counted to three, and we pushed off. And it was a long drop. I can still feel that velocity through my ears. I'm looking at the water below me, I shut my eyes, and I hit the water. And the second I impacted the water, I knew something was wrong. It was like I'd been hit by a stun gun or something. I didn't feel any pain. I didn't feel any pressure on top of me. I had no idea what happened. But there was this, this strange aura that I couldn't feel anything. I couldn't even feel the water. You know, I was completely lucid. So I think, okay, maybe this is gonna wear off. I try to kick up to the surface. There's nothing. I try to flail my arms to get up to the top, and there's nothing. I didn't know it at the time, but we jumped at the same time. I fell a little bit faster than he did, and the witnesses said that it looked as if I opened up the water for him, and he came right directly on top of me, and like a light switch snapped my neck. And it was so instantaneous, I didn't feel it. But my fourth and fifth cervical vertebrae were instantly shattered, and I was paralyzed from the neck down. So I'm sitting, I'm floating there in the water, trying to process what had happened. Floating, like I felt like an, like an astronaut, kind of just in between the surface and, and the ground somewhere. I didn't even think about drowning, I was just thinking about not moving, but it didn't take long before that started becoming the forethought in my mind. And if you've ever tried holding your breath to see how long you could do it, in a swimming pool or something like that. You know, you know, you get to that point where the alarm's kind of going off in your head. I was getting to that point awful quick. And I suddenly kind of felt this strange feeling on my back and my body felt lifted. So there was a short sense of relief because I felt like, okay, I'm on the surface. I could kind of sort of tell where I was in space. But I was still face down in the water. And I was running out of breath very fast. And I, I used to be a lifeguard I was familiar with backboarding drills, and I started thinking about how people drown. It's not because they run out of air, it's because when the body starts getting to that point, it instinctively inhales. And I was reaching that point, so water rushes into your lungs, and that's how you pass away, and I was terrified I was gonna get to that point. I finally felt someone starting to tug my body. He still wasn't pulling me over. He still wasn't pulling me over. Finally he did, and the first thing I yelled was, I'm awake, keep my head up, keep my head up. Because I was afraid they all thought I was unconscious. And it was the man that jumped on me. I never knew his name. But he saved my life. He brought me to that beach, and as soon as I sort of sat there, all the, the, the noises of, you know, the little waters had splashed, and I was on that beach, and everything was really quiet for a second, no one said a word. And I just said, I'm paralyzed. That's the first thing that came out of my mouth. I knew what had happened. So to give you all an idea of what was happening to my body, I want to give you a little bit of a taste of Spinal Cord Injury 101. So we all know the power of the brain, right? It's the guiding force of the central nervous system. It pilots all of our thoughts, all of our movements. It sends information down to our body to move. It receives information in, back up, for sensory information. The scientists have realized it's more than just a conduit of relaying information. It's very much an extension of the brain. 
just like the brain, that means it's very fragile. So it's encased in 33 individual vertebrae to protect it. They go down, down the neck, down the back. And between each vertebrae are nerves that splay out and innervate different muscles, different parts of the body. So at your shoulder, in the purple area, the nerves come out and let your shoulder move. Farther down, it innervates your biceps and your triceps, into your core, your muscles, down in the yellow area, your legs. So wherever that injury happens on that spinal cord, the information is cut off. Sort of like a river of information coming down your spinal cord. It's like a dam right there. And you don't have any, any control below that. Well, I was hurt at the fourth cervical vertebrae. That's very, it's right there in the purple. So I had absolutely nothing below my neck. So I was airlifted to a hospital and wheeled immediately into the MRI and, and was basically given the diagnosis that I had a sustained a severe spinal cord injury and, and I had very, every injury is different. Every recovery is different but the very likelihood was that I was paralyzed from the neck down, and I was introduced to the wonderful world of quadriplegia, which looks like this. So, sp spinal cord injury and paralysis, it's a lot more than just moving. That's the one thing that people think of is moving. But when your central nervous system is knocked offline, everything is affected. Your blood pressure, your ability to, your body's ability to regulate heat, um, the ability to sweat. Uh, all these things wreak havoc on your entire body. So when you're paralyzed, I suddenly couldn't be upright for more than a few seconds without passing out. My limbs had to be constantly arranged and moved so the muscles wouldn't lock up and suffer contractures. I had to take shots in my belly to prevent from blood clotting. I was introduced to this, kind of this brand new uniform. I, every night I had splints on my arms and fingers so my fingers wouldn't get, get contractured. I had boots on my legs so my feet wouldn't get contractured. I had an abdominal binder that would have to be wrapped around me to try to help with that blood pressure. I had, to be, I had no bowel and bladder function. Teams of nurses would have to rearrange my body every two hours throughout the night to prevent bed sores. They're all the secondary complications that are really more important than the whole paralysis part. And this became my new reality as I'm trying to understand everything um, as I'm in the ICU. And it's something that my family and I started to learn about and sort of the horrors that was this the rest of my life. But we also learned a new part of healthcare, how expensive it is. We all know healthcare is a hot button topic. It's most of the time the conversation revolves around helping people get coverage when they're up, they're uninsured. But what's often not talked about, because a lot of people don't realize that there's a void, is what happens for continued care, for those of us that are insured. I hear, and I'm guessing most of you have great health insurance plans, whether that's through a private company, whether it's through Medicare. But what happens to you if you have a stroke or you have an injury like I did, a brain injury, a spinal cord injury, something serious? And I'm not talking about the initial coverage to be in a hospital or the, the initial stay. I'm talking about the long-term rehabilitation that's needed for the years that it takes to try to maximize recovery. Within the first year of a spinal cord injury, healthcare costs are between $400,000 to $1 million. And that's just the first year, and that's the average. Many of those are much more than that. It's similar in subsequent years. These individuals go home, they get put right back into the healthcare system because they have pressure sores, they have muscle contractures, and so forth. So let me take you on a little bit of a tour of what happens when, when you deal with an injury like this. Within one week of my injury, I was discharged from the acute care hospital. Acute care meaning just your normal hospital where there's the ICU and there's nurses. My body was not ready yet. I told you I had all these complications going on. I was battling infections. I had a blood clot in my lung. Um, I had C. diff because of all the antibiotics I was on. It was, it was a disaster. But providers realize that there are, that because of those high costs, they're constantly needing to push patients to the next level. And in some cases, that's fine. Everyone wants to get home, everyone wants to get better. But when you're talking about a catastrophic injury, it's a different conversation because so much care is needed. So if after one week, the transition was to an inpatient rehabilitation hospital. And 
At the time, that was fantastic. That's what I wanted. In my mind, I wanted to get to rehab as soon as possible. But, but even when I was discharged and admitted to the rehab hospital, it became very clear early on that I was on a time clock as there, there as well. The rehab hospital is like your beacon of hope. This is where you get daily physical therapy. You start learning all about what you need to do to try to regain your body back. You get daily occupational therapy. You get daily speech therapy. It's a, all of a sudden, it's army time regimen of, of therapy, and which is exactly what I wanted. You also have round the clock nursing care. So naturally, this was the place that I was going to get better. Within the first couple weeks, I started seeing signs of recovery. I could start to flex a thigh muscle. I could start to twitch a finger, which were huge signs for a spinal cord injury because it showed that there were messages that were making their way through that blocked pathway. Minimal signs, but huge signs. So certainly, I was in the place I needed to be. But the average stay at an inpatient rehabilitation hospital is 35 days. And you have to imagine what is going on in those 35 days. Not only you're doing with rehab, but your whole family starts to have to be educated about what's happening with your life. You have to start realizing that you have to get fitted for possibly a power wheelchair. You have to rearrange your home. You have to start learning how to find a caregiver, how to learn how to transfer to a wheelchair, how to feed yourself, all of the things that are going on. And that's not even talking about finances and you know, the jobs and everything. This is all going on in those 35 days. So the, the, the care, the therapy quickly becomes training you to adapt to an injury instead of learning how to recover from the injury. And that's not something I wanted to hear as I was slowly starting to get better. And we realized that this wasn't just one situation. This is what it's like for everyone that are recovering from strokes and spinal cord injury and brain injury. Within, within the first two weeks of my injury, I started getting my first denial from insurance that said, you got to get home. You've plateaued. That was the key word. Your recovery is slowing. How do you even grasp that? This rehab hospital was my, like I said before, was my beacon of hope. But I started making, I was making gains. My therapists were amazing. The rehab hospital fought for me. We, we tried to, you know, we appealed these decisions and we were successful for a few. Most people are discharged before that 35 days. The recoveries I made, the recovery I was making within the first month, we actually got to stay for eight weeks which is unheard of. Eight weeks is a long time. At the end of those eight weeks, I was, I mean, I was still quadriplegic, but I could move my ankle, a huge win. I could actually, I couldn't move my arms, but I could move my fingers, huge win. I was just trying to focus on every single thing in therapy. It was like moving concrete slabs of my skin, but I would try to do everything I could to concentrate on those Fire, firing muscles and firing my nervous system. But eventually, eventually that cap hit, and it was, it was, it was four, it was um, two months after my injury, and I was still nowhere where I needed to be. This picture was taken on one of my last days of therapy. It looks like I'm in much better shape than I was, because I'm upright. But the picture is blurry for a reason, because it was taken in like about a fraction of a second. I could only be upright for a couple, for literally a couple of seconds before I, before I would pass out. And my therapists are pretty much holding me up there. But I was able to actually contract my hamstrings and I was able to, it, it looks like I was able to stand. But the bottom line is, is that this was the time where I needed therapy the most and I was being discharged. So we had options. They weren't good. They were go home and insurance would then cover a total of, um, Sorry, I skipped one of those things. Insurance would, come, would cover a total of 30 outpatient days. 30 outpatient days. And, and I say days, I really mean visits. So once you leave the inpatient hospital, then you're granted individual visits to continue your recovery. That's the same amount that people are given if they are recovering from an ACL tear. And I had my entire central nervous system to, to, to rehab. So the options basically were you could go back home, you could um, figure out how to, what, what to do for coming back for 30 outpatient days. And, or you, you, once insurance was up, you could private pay at you know, $400 for a session, which is unaffordable for just about anyone. Insurance would pay for a $40,000 puff wheelchair that I could power with my mouth, which is what I would have needed at the time, but they wouldn't pay for any more rehab. So we did something that was a little bit unconventional, 
We went to a nursing home instead, which doctors sort of advised against because they had no idea how to care for a quadriplegic, and they were right. But we went there because I could still get some physical therapy and occupational therapy, and that was basically what was paramount in our mind. So I was able to continue therapy there. My parents, my sister, my friends and family became my caregivers, even in the nursing home. My parents never left my side. My friends never left my side. They learned how to feed me. They learned how to turn me. They learned how to stretch me. In rehab, I continued to get better, so slowly, but better. After about a month, I could actually sit upright, a month after in the nursing home. Then I started to be able to move both of my legs. And I started to be able to actually stand for a few seconds. These were major gains. By the end of my time there, I started realizing that once again, these denials kept happening. At this time, I wanted out of the nursing home, but I wanted that rehab more. So I wanted to stay as long as I could. And sure enough, four months in a nursing home, six months after my accident, I was basically told, once again, you're done. At this time, I was just starting to take steps. And insurance had said, you've plateaued. <laughs> I still couldn't move my arms. I still couldn't feed myself. I still didn't have a properly functioning bowel and bladder. So what do you do? Why did this void exist in Indianapolis, which is a fantastic city with fantastic healthcare providers? And we realized it exists pretty much everywhere. There was no place to go to have a continuum of care. So we found a place that did. Unfortunately, it was all the way in Salt Lake City, Utah. We heard about this place that was started by a doctor who had an injury similar to mine and his physical therapist. They saw the same void and they started this clinic that would say, we're gonna do something wild here. We're gonna treat people after insurance expires and we're gonna do it at something that's affordable, not $400 an hour, something that's affordable. And we heard about this. We didn't know if we could have the capacity to fly across the country you know, my parents were still my caregivers. I was in a wheelchair still. I couldn't, like I said, I couldn't feed myself. But we realized that it's something that we had to try to do. So in February of 2011, six months after my injury, my sister drove a car all the way to Salt Lake City. So we have one there. My, my parents and I got on a plane. For the first time, we were outside of nursing care. We were completely on our own. We flew to Salt Lake City, Utah. We were able to get an apartment for a good uh, for, for a cheap rent that was sort of donated to this facility because this was an outpatient facility like a gym and the second we rolled in we knew we were in the right place finally we were at a place that wasn't putting a time clock on my rehabilitation what happened at this facility we were at was we were introduced to an entirely new school of thought for rehabilitation it was focused on providing access instead of providing, uh, what, providing what insurance would allow. And they had the capacity to treat you longer at affordable rates, and they had therapy pieces of equipment that they didn't even have in Indiana. And a lot of the reason they didn't offer them in Indiana was because it took a lot of therapists to help operate them. This treadmill system you see that I'm on takes four people to operate. That's not very cost effective. It's hard enough just to get normal rehab. But this was a gravity supported, a gravity eliminated treadmill system that would kind of help retrain my nervous system. It would help me learn my walking. Um, the picture on the right is electri an electrical stimulation device that would stimulate the muscles when the brain can't. Um, this is fairly common in, in rehab, but not to the extent where they have all those 24 channels of, of electricity to really help jumpstart my nervous system, help activate those muscles when my brain couldn't. But most importantly, it just provided access to it. I rehabbed every day, Monday through Friday, for hours a day, just relearning everything. And this place would let me stay afterward, let me use their gym. It was a hybrid model of rehab and, um, and a gym. And it was just something that changed I me, mean, really changed our entire life. So after a year and a half, I'm taking steps. I'm walking again. We got rid of my wheelchair. The last thing that I wanted to do before I came home was try to figure out a way to drive again. Now, the injury happened at the level that I thought, if you rewind back to when I told you about how the nerves kind of splay out at each place, 
the injury happened at the level that really controlled my shoulders. So my shoulders were really my weakest part to this day. And they were the slowest part to come back. And there was a high school right next to the apartment that my mother and I were in that had a little driver's ed course. And after rehab, we would go there every day. We got a little, we got a little spinner knob on the steering wheel so I could try to drive it with one hand. And I would just fail and fail and fail. And it was so frustrating because I just didn't have the strength to turn. Well, I finally got that strength. I was able to turn that steering wheel. And in June of 2012, I actually drove myself all the way back home to Indianapolis, pretty much the way I am right now, walking. And I'm independent, so, so thank you. So, so I'm home. I beat paralysis, right? I was victorious. I could get my life back. But then what? For the last two and a half years, my life revolved around my recovery and getting everything I had back. And suddenly I came home and so much had changed. I was still disabled, very much disabled. To this day, from below my neck, I still can't feel any temperature or textures. Everything feels like pins and needles, like when your arm's asleep. My left shoulder is permanently paralyzed and dislocated, so I'm in constant discomfort there, it's just dangling. You might have noticed much of my left side is still paralyzed. Um, I can't use my fingers much. I wear a brace on my leg to help me walk. All the things I used to be able to do to define myself, I can never do. Sports, being active, running. I get home, I didn't have a job anymore. I didn't have a home, aside from my parents. I didn't have my own home. And what do you do? My parents, my, all my friends are, they're, they're, they're getting married, they're having kids. But suddenly there was a transformation almost in my psyche that had happened to me where a lot of that stuff wasn't as important anymore. It just, a lot of it felt egocentric. And I knew that I needed to do something more meaningful, more powerful. And it happened to my entire family. We just got inspired to do what we could to try to recreate what we experienced and change the healthcare system in Indiana. And that's exactly what we tried, that's exactly what we did. We started having paperwork to, to form a 501c3. At first we thought, just thought we were going to be a foundation and raise money and help one of the hospital systems do this. We run into a lot of roadblocks. We started raising money with friends and family. We raised $80,000 to try to help jumpstart this type of program. We pounded the pavement talking to all the major healthcare systems, all the rehabilitation hospitals. It didn't make money. There's a reason why they're hamstrung and not able to provide that continuum of care. I spoke at a spinal cord injury support group and there I was introduced to a physical therapist by the name of Nora Foster who worked in neuro and she understood the void as well. And she said, yes, this is exactly what needs to happen from a clinician standpoint. And then we had our first angel, the University of Indianapolis, who said, we're inspired by what you're trying to do. We'll give you a little tiny gym where Nora can start seeing her first patients. And in 2015, Neuro Hope was born. This is a tiny little gym. You can see this is Nora on the left. Our desk was in the same room as the gym. All that was in that gym was a therapy mat. We didn't have any spinal cord injury specific pieces of equipment, and we also didn't have any money. I didn't draw a salary. Nora wasn't paid a fraction of what she was worth as a doctor of physical therapy. So I drove all the way to Michigan to appease to the headquarters of a, of a company that makes disabled uh, recumbent steppers, and he donated a piece. I drove all the way to Minnesota to try to appease to a company to help with this, a standing frame. And I got a piece donated there. And suddenly we had some specialized equipment for rehab. I drove to Baltimore to try to get this electrical stimulation machine. It cost $38,000. That didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> but we did get one eventually. And we started seeing our very first patients. Now I'll tell you, it's hard enough to, if many of you are entrepreneurs here in this room, it's hard enough to, to, to start a, a business. It's hard enough to start a charity. It's hard enough to start a healthcare clinic. It's an entirely different ballgame to try to start one of all three <laughs> that doesn't have a very good business model. To make it work, we relied much more on insurance reimbursement. 
we started taking the steps of being credentialed by Medicare and private insurance, and that was a, a ball game in itself. But then we needed to do more than that. We needed fundraisers, we needed community partnerships, we needed a whole system to help us grow. And we didn't take our, our we, we, we didn't stop our fight there. We, we knew we needed more to keep growing. And we went to the Indiana State Legislature and told the story, told the idea, told of all these cutting edge facilities that we could bring here. And we were successful. And in 2015, then Governor Pence signed into a law that would actually help specific programs like ours that would go more than just helping people in the rehabilitation process, but would also help people that were chronically injured, that didn't have a place to go, to keep them out of the healthcare system, where they could continue to their rehab, but they could also continue their, their quality of life. Everyone needs to work out. It's even more so when you're dealing with a disability. So this law helped us really fund an expansion. And over the last three years, we've had the opportunity to grow to a new gym. We've hired a small team of therapists and trainers. And most importantly, we've helped more than 50 people on their road to recovery. And this is our gym now. You'll notice a lot of those pieces of equipment are familiar. We got the treadmill system. We have many of the electrical stimulation machines. Just last year, we were invited to be one of 11 sites in, in the world associated with the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. And we actually are taking patient data from a lot of the, the um, interventions we use. But we focus on more than insurance. We focus on a different paradigm of healthcare that's really patient-centric. And that's what our mission is entirely about. And I want to share a video of a, a patient. This was just taken last week of a young lady who came all the way from California to our, our site. She's been getting rehab at a lot of other places as well. She's been very fortunate. But she came to us. She's doing fantastic. And these are some of her first unassisted steps without a walker. That's a powerful moment. <laughs> Her gait kinematics need some work, but that's not the point in this video. She had an injury similar to mine, where these injuries are different. Physical therapy did not cure her, it didn't cure me, but putting her in a position to maximize recovery and not cutting off because insurance said so, and having the opportunity to benefit your life, that's what got her there, in addition to her extraordinarily powerful will. She's been through a lot, and she's not done yet. So this journey that started with me so personally, that was focused on my recovery, has evolved into so much more. When I woke up in that ICU, I literally thought my life was over. I thought, I always knew I wanted to do something powerful with this life. I didn't know what that was going to be. And I felt like time had run out. I felt like. My life had passed me by. Adversity can change the trajectory of your life, but it can also be the catalyst to, to greater purpose and to something with much more meaning. But it doesn't have to be something so catastrophic as a life-changing injury. I think we all have that capacity for change in us. We just have to be able to figure out how to find it. And it's never too late to find it. And I hope all of you are able to find that passion as well. So thank you so much. I appreciate the time.